Welcome back to the second hour of our program. So in Argentina, don't cry for me. No, anyway, in Argentina, the inflation rate is around 70% right now. And uh, some observers are predicting over on Bloomberg that it could hit as high as 100% by the end of this year. What the heck is going on? And what does this mean for the various crises occurring around South and Central America that uh, have a considerable impact on us, particularly when their citizens end up on our southern border. On the line with us is our old friend, Mark Weisbrot, the co-director, and he's not old, he's been our friend for a long time, <laughs> the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, the president of Just Foreign Policy, the author of Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy, the website CEPR.net. You can tweet him at Mark Weisbrot, W-E-I-S-B-R-O-T, on the old Twitter machine. And Mark, tell us what's going on here down in Argentina. How, how did it get to this? Well, that's a, very, that's a good question to start with. And this is really something that the present government inherited from the previous one. Uh, the, the previous, previous government, government was a right-wing government, was it not? That's right. And we'll get to that in a minute. But, I mean, they came in in uh, 2015. And in 2018, they signed an agreement with the IMF for the largest loan the IMF has ever made to any country, and Argentina is not a huge country, so that's really large. It was $57 billion. And the IMF admitted actually in a report that they did on their own evalu internal evaluation, they said that it was, they basically said it was a terrible failure, that uh, it, it just, uh, it actually made the economy worse which it did. I mean, the uh, inflation went from 18 to 54 percent uh, in uh, in uh, like uh, not even two years. Uh, no, maybe it was. Yeah, 18. Yeah, it was not even two years. It went that high, and interest rates shot up to 75 percent. And the debt, which this government is still dealing with, uh, went uh, from uh, 53 to 86 or even more, probably 90% uh, of GDP. So that's what the mess that this government inherited. So the, the previous administration basically pulled a Reagan. Yeah. Triple the was, national it, debt and, you know, go ahead. Yeah, and and and, and, and added all that in inflation as well, and it just made it a, a real mess. And so this government, and then this government got hit, you know, this government took power in, and was elected in 2019. And of course, the pandemic hit the next uh, year. It was late 2019, so they got hit with the pandemic. Right? But in 2021, they've actually uh, done pretty well. The economy uh, grew 10.4% in wow. uh, 2021. And so they had a, a very good recovery. They weren't able to bring inflation down. And of course, in the last couple of months, it's it's gone up some. Uh, but they didn't let it rise. And here's the thing. People don't really understand because the media tends to present the whole economy as one number. Uh, you know, inflation is 70 percent. It's, you know, and, you know, and of course, you have the same thing going on with Biden. It's a little bit similar. Of course, it's a much more extreme case. But the point is that, you know, people here think 70 percent inflation, everybody must be dying. But in fact, uh, incomes, wages have have kept up with that, so they're not really uh, getting hit by it uh, as like you would think from such high inflation. That doesn't mean it's not a problem that you have to get right. rid of it, but you have to get rid of it. And this is a lesson for us too: uh, you have to get rid of it in a way that doesn't make the cure worse than the the disease. And that's what this government has been uh, trying to do. Uh, they restructured. In 2020, they restructured, uh, at the end of 2020, they restructured 80, uh, $85 billion in private debt. Uh, and because, you know, they had to get rid of some some debt, yeah. a, a lot of debt as much as they could. And then, of course, they negotiated an IMF agreement in March. And that was, you know, probably the best IMF agreement that, you know, anybody had negotiated in, in Latin America because it, it it basically rolled over the the uh, the most of the that 57 billion that they borrowed uh, going forward so to give them more time and without austerity uh, oh that's to great is be the, able to recover is the IMF yeah, starting to I mean starting know, to abandon neoliberalism people, what's that no yeah. I mean it's still look if you look at it from a point of view of justice, 
Okay. I mean, they admitted that they made the biggest loan they ever made. And by the way, probably under pressure from, uh, from Trump, uh, mm -hmm. They made the because they you know they they wanted the right wing government. They made the biggest loan they ever made for for partly at least political uh, reasons, and they saddled this country with a horrible debt while dr driving up inflation, and uh, and making a mess uh, by their own admission out of the economy. That is making the economy worse, throwing it into uh, recession. By uh, that was the other part. You know they had these. Uh, what what we call you know economists call uh, pro cyclical policies they 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 had them uh, cutting spending uh, while the economy was shrinking and they doubled down on it uh, in I think it was October of uh, 2018 when it wasn't working and so that uh, that was a terrible set of mistakes that the IMF made. So if you're looking at it from the point of view, just they should just forgive the whole debt because they made the mess right. with the right wing government. They're not going to do but, that. Though. So they're not going to do that. But in the future, uh, they may have to, uh, you know, they might have to give them more of a break than they got. This is very uh, interesting. This, this idea that um, you can have inflation and not have it whack people. I, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of people who are falling through the cracks and it is whacking them, but, yeah. but that broadly wages are keeping up with it. I remember- Yeah, uh, and poverty has been reduced as, as well uh, from, uh, let's see, I think it was uh, 43 to, to 36 percent in the last uh, year or so. By the new government, uh, because you've got a progressive yeah. government in there now. Um, yeah. I, I remember decades ago, I, I was in Israel and it was the, uh, the month that they changed their currency. Um, they basically took a zero off the end of the shekels because they had had all this inflation in the previous years and, and it was up to, you know, a thousand shekels to buy a loaf of bread or something like that. And maybe they took two zeros off it. I don't remember. I don't know if you if you were uh, attending to international politics back then. This, my recollection is this was the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but uh, how does that work? How does a country deal with that kind of internal inflation? And I mean, isn't that just functionally a depreciation of their of their currency? And and does that help them on an international stage? A well, devaluation essentially. I mean, there are you know the high inflation. I mean, there's been high, you know, the world used to have much higher inflation. Most countries used to have much higher inflation uh, before the last, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years. And there are different ways to uh, to handle that. Uh, the Israeli case that you were talking about, you know, you did have like an awful lot of wages and in, indexed to inflation and everything, uh, a lot of things indexed to inflation. And so the economy did adapt to it some. But the problem is that there's still... Uh, the big risk you get when you get into the hundreds is that <clears throat> you can get hyperinflation like mm -hmm. Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua. They all had that at various times. And when you get hyperinflation, I mean, that can be gotten rid of, too. Uh, and there are cases where it was gotten rid of pretty fast. But the point is that it's it's a real mess. And when you get yeah. hyper, that means like nobody that destroys really everything. To hold yeah, that kind of destroys your economy and you really have to do something. Right. So yeah, you don't want that, but you don't even want to get close to it. And you, you do have to, you know, just even the constant crises that you have, like even the last last few weeks was an example, or last maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, August, you know, it's maybe almost two months. You had a big uh, depreciation in the exchange rate and that pushed up inflation. And of course, if you don't do anything, then the inflation will uh, will cause the exchange rate to fall again, and you get what's called an inflation depreciation. Which which spiral. country was that the case for? This was Argentina. Okay. Yeah, so they've had some trouble right. in the last month or two. But uh, again, and you know, here in the U.S., it's kind of ridiculous, but they're always trying to convince us now. And of course, Republicans have that same uh, uh, interest in, in in winning the next two elections mm -hmm. by sabotaging the economy. So they're trying to convince the Fed and the and, and everybody and you know as much as they can in Congress not to uh, have to, 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 to push the economy into recession right. because that's what they actually and want. Powell just came out and said that there may well be a recession as a result of the efforts yeah, that he's yeah. taking and he's he's yeah. an old Republican and he's an old bankster um, 
you know, Robert Reich is just this morning on his, uh, his Substack post just ripping Powell a new one, saying this inflation is mostly caused by giant corporations just squeezing the blood out of consumers, you know, just jacking up prices and, and profits uh, to no end. And if the government doesn't deal with that, uh, all these uh, hikes in the inflation or in the uh, interest rates are, are simply going to produce a recession and you're not going to get rid of your inflation. What say you about that, Mark Weisbrod? Yeah, well, I think that it is mostly external causes, right? The gasoline increased 50 to 60 percent in one year. You have that. You have the, all the uh, supply chain disruptions, the COVID and transition to the post-COVID uh, economy. And, of course, the, the war. Uh, itself, which is moving the gasoline prices and food prices. And then, yeah, what you mentioned, of course, some corporations try to profit by it and do profit by it as well. And so these are not causes that are going to be, uh, like you said, the, the main causes of the inflation, all but maybe two percentage points of the increase, uh, don't have anything to do with uh, macroeconomic policy, either the uh, price rates, quantitative easing, or the... Uh, uh, but big budget deficits that we did run to get out of the pandemic recession, mm -hmm. you know, in in uh, uh, 2020 and, and 2021. And so I think that, yeah, this is really important to, to for people to understand. And I think the media doesn't really do a good job of explaining this. They do give, I think they have helped to give people, even though they don't really like most of the media, doesn't like the Republicans. Uh, this is one of those things you could you can have a whole show on. Why does the media actually help them so much when they don't like them? <laughs> you know? Well, a lot of these media like are, are owned by giant corporations or billionaires. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's the Republicans' constituency. I think that's part of it, but I don't think that it's it's. Yeah. I think it's really something else that no, I can't I, really, I'm not I, even I get trying it. to explain. It. I get <laughs> it. Mark, we're out of time, but it's always great talking with you, Mark. The great Mark Weisbrot, uh, Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR.net. Mark, thanks so much for dropping by today. 